world she traveled. And her women who made a difference. A cool kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview of Sandra Brecky, conducted by Mary on January 26, 2009. Okay. Uh, my name is Sandy Brecky, S-A-N-D-Y. Last name is B-R-E-K-K-E. Okay. Um, so first off, where were you born? I was born right here in La Crosse, Wisconsin at Gunderson Lutheran several years ago. <laughs> in 1967, actually. So what was it like here back um, you know, it it wasn't that much different than it is today, really. Things don't really look that much different. Um, I went to State Road Elementary School and then Lincoln Middle School, and I graduated from Central. And in fact, there's still some teachers at Central that I had when I went to school there. Cool. Um, what did you do most often as a kid? Like, did you do any activities that? You know, as a kid, I grew up. Um, going out Highway 33, so just headed up Irish Hill. Mm -hmm. And at that time, that was really pretty much out in the country. And so as kids, we were outside all the time. You know, we'd get up in the morning, and we'd pack ourselves a lunch, and out we'd go. We had bluffs behind our house with caves, and um, and that's what we did all day long. We played outside. Or I'd ride my bike into town with my friends, and we went to Pettibone Beach. That was really big back in the 70s and 80s to go to Pettibone. <laughs> Cool, yeah, I live up on the bluff, by up Irish Hill. Do you live up on the the top? Mm -hmm. Where you go, like FBO or FA, is it? Yeah. Okay, okay, so not very far. <laughs> um, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, can you tell me a little bit about, about your family background? Yeah, yeah, um, my, Mom and Dad, um, my mom grew up in West Salem. My dad grew up in Racine, and they met in college. They both went to the UW-Madison, and that's where they met. And they moved to La Crosse um, back in the early 60s, and my dad worked at train company, and my mom was a nurse at Gunderson Lutheran. And I have an older brother, a younger sister, and a younger brother, so one of four kids in our family. Um, so did you have any role models when you were little? Like any? Uh, any role models when I was little? Um, well other than my mom was, has always been my role model. I do remember periods of time in my life where there were different role models. Mm -hmm. um, I did gymnastics as a little kid and Nadia Comaneci, I don't know if you guys know her. <laughs> she was the very first gymnast in the Olympics to score a perfect 10. And so she was my idol for years and years and years. Um, and then as I got a little older into middle school, we had, you know, idols like, you know, like Hannah Montana. Mm -hmm. There were, you know, there were those kind of rock star idols, an actor and actress idol, idols that we had growing up. Um, you know, I think, so when I was a young kid, it was kind of those people that were probably in the media that, you know, at the time you think as your role model. Mm -hmm. um, but looking back, really, it was people I came into contact with, like teachers um, and friends of my parents and people in the community that now I look back and I think, oh, they really affected what I did in my life. Cool, okay. Um, so, um, did you enjoy school when you were? In middle school, elementary school? Um, I have to say middle school wasn't very much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Not the classes and what I was learning, but I thought middle school um, was really hard because it was really hard to find a, like where you fit in. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was everything that was going on in middle school. Oh. Was you know, where you fit in, what group of kids you fit in. Um, mm -hmm. You felt like you had to wear what everybody else was wearing, um, do what everybody else was doing, act like everybody else was acting. Um, but then when I got to high school, you kind of realized that there's all these different groups and you can fit in to all of them if you want. Um, and you don't have to worry so much about people judging you um, and you can just kind of be who you are. 
so I, lo- you know, middle school was really tough. High school, I loved. I was in um, cross country and gymnastics and track. So I had lots of different friends in those groups and I loved doing those sports. Um, and I met great teachers in high school as well. Um, were there any teachers that inspired you or influenced you to do nursing or anything for you? Um, I'm not sure if it was a teacher that so much inspired me to do nursing other than growing up listening to my mom tell stories. I think that's probably what inspired me the most to go into nursing. There were definitely teachers along the way that inspired me just to do things in life. Um, but it was probably my mom who inspired me most to be. What nursing. kind of stories did she tell? Like You know, she would come home. She was an emergency room nurse. Um, and she would come home telling the stories of things that she had seen in the emergency room. And, and she was also always the one called upon, you know, whenever we were someplace that something was happening. You know, if someone was hurt or sick, it, you know, someone was always calling my mom to come and, and help out. And I always thought that was such a neat thing, that she had that knowledge base to mm-hmm. be able to help people that way. Can you? What is the St. Clair Health Mission? The St. Clair Health Mission is a free clinic. It was started by Sister LeClaire Barris, who is a f- one of the Franciscan nuns. Um, and she started it back in 1993. And the people that are seen at the St. Clair Health Mission are the people in the community that are poor and can't afford to go to the doctor. And they don't have any other way to get any kind of coverage that will let them go to the doctor. So it's really people who just have no way to ever go to the doctor. And so that's what, and everybody at the St. Clair Health Mission is a volunteer. So that's what we do there. How did you first find out about the St. Clair Health Mission? Um, In 1993, when the St. Clair Health Mission started, I had just moved back to town. My husband and I um, lived in England. And we moved back to La Crosse so he could start working here. Um, and they were just starting the St. Clair Health Mission, and it was in the media a lot. Um, and I was working just part-time as a nurse in the ICU at Franciscan Scamp. Um, and that's, so that's why I, you know, I heard about it. I thought, what a great idea. And I wanted to be part of it, so that's when I started volunteering. Um, why did your, you and your husband go to move to England? We moved to England after he he works as a physician, and during college I had always had this idea that I was gonna when I was done with college, I was just gonna take off and go to Europe and just travel around the world. And he was at the time finishing up his residency, so it wasn't really practical for him to go travel around the world. So he found a place where he could go and practice and learn some things from a, a surgeon that he had been interested in over in England so that we could move over there and he could practice there and we could still do a lot of traveling. Um, when did you first start volunteering at the St. Clair Health Mission? I started volunteering, I think it was about a year after the clinic opened. So in 1994 was when I started volunteering. Okay. Um, How did your first day at the clinic go? Like, what happened during it? Was there any experiences on the first day that? Yeah, I remember uh, my background in nursing was in ICU. And so when you're working in the ICU, your patients are really, really sick. Oftentimes they're on life support. So you're not talking to your patients a lot, mostly because they're really not able to talk. But working, this was the first time I'd worked in a clinic clinic setting where you actually got to talk to people and ask them questions and find out what was wrong. And I found that to be so interesting. And just to hear people's story, you know, people would tell me stories that I thought, I had no idea the struggles that they had, um, you know, just to get medical care. Like, it, it, it was really surprising to me what was going on that I, that I really didn't know about. Um, is there any, what is, like, what is required for people to be able to volunteer? Like, what do they have to have in their background and 
their career. We have all different kinds of volunteers. There are you know, doctors and nurses and pharmacists and lab technicians and social workers who volunteer, and those are all people that have been to school and have, you know, are licensed in their profession. But there's also a whole host of other people that come in and do kind of the day-to-day -day stuff to get the clinic up and running and moving. And, and those people are the, the critical ones. And many of them come from, you know, varied backgrounds. Some of them, you know, are just high school graduates. Um, and they'll come and volunteer at the clinic. Um, you know, there's other people that are retired. So not everybody has to have a medical background, just really um, a willingness to do something to help others. Okay. Um, what, what is the St. Clair Health Mission? Like, do you, you help people who can't get health care, right? And so what kind of things do you do to help out? Like. What do, what do the patients have to do to get care, taken care of? When the, the patients, so the, the clinic is open on a couple, on three different days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And on Tuesday and Thursday, um, we have volunteers there and we function like an urgent care. So if you had fallen and injured your arm, you would come in on a Tuesday or Thursday and you'd see our social worker and nurses and doctor and we could do x-rays on you we could if your arm was broken we would cast it or put it in a sling um, and then we'd follow you at the clinic um, Wednesday clinic is um, it's for people that have a little more complicated chronic illnesses like diabetes or heart disease people that we need to see over and over again and they'll need to be seen for you know ever and ever um, we have them see the same team. So we really do pretty much, it's kind of anything and everything walks through our door. We never know what is coming in that night. So anything that someone needs to see a doctor for, knowing that they can't go to the one of the clinics and pay for it, they can come to Sinclair Health Mission. Um, what were your thoughts when you became the director of the health mission? Um, my thoughts, I think, were, can I really take all this on and do all this? Um, you know, I had, you know, we had talked about it for years, and I always thought, oh, I, you know, I don't have the time. I don't know that I can muster up the energy. But what I found was that there's so many other people that are willing to help that it's not just me doing the St. Clair Health Mission. It's me and a whole host of people who are also you know, pretty much on the same mission to help people. Um, so it isn't just me. You know, I just happen to be the director, but there's a whole host of other people who really come in and do whatever needs to be done to keep, keep the clinic going. What are you looking forward to doing here on in St. Clair Health Mission? What am I looking forward to doing? Um, what I would really love to do is to be able to close the clinic which sounds funny, <laughs> but really, um, and I've worked with people, um, legislators, you know, like Tara Johnson, who think that if our country could come together and have some kind of universal health care, so we wouldn't have to have a place like a free clinic where someone can only go, you know, three times a week. So if you break your arm on Friday, you have to wait until Tuesday, where you should be able to just walk in Friday and get care right away. Um, if we had some health system in this country that included everybody, whether they had money or they had no money, so that they could get health care, then there wouldn't be a need for the Sinclair Health Mission. As much as I love it and I love what we do, um, I think that our country needs to be able to take care of the people that live in the country. And people shouldn't have to suffer and wait and not get the health care they need just because they can't afford it. Um, did any of your coworkers or anyone inspire you in any way? Oh, gosh. Lots and lots of them. Um, Sister LeClaire Barris, who is the founder of the clinic, um, is probably one of the most inspirational people I've met. She... Um, she just she inspires everyone around her to want to help others. She 
um, is very non-judgmental. Um, so when people come in, you know, she she just shows that, you know, everybody is worth her time and her energy. Um, she's just she's an inspirational person. And our volunteers, I look at we have. 250 volunteers, many of them have been there the 15 years the clinic has been open. And they come back and back and back. Um, yeah, it is. It's an amazing place. It really is. Um, so, what made you keep volunteering? Like, when you first started, what made you keep coming back? And Yeah, I think, I think some of the reason I kept coming back is because I wanted to really understand. Um, the struggles that people had who weren't able to go and get health insurance or afford to go to the doctor. Because I never, when you work in the hospital, you don't think about how is this person paying for this. You just take care of them. But then to realize, you know, when you're out at a clinic like St. Clair Health Mission that, you know, I'm only taking care of the people that can afford it. There's a whole host of people that need care that can't afford it that won't ever get it unless there's a place like St. Clair Health Mission. Um, you know, I just really felt like I wanted to understand, you know, what was going on. And the other thing is, I think any time you volunteer, you just feel good about what you're doing. You know, you feel good that, you know, you maybe made someone's life a little bit better today. You know, if even just for a minute or two. Um, you never know when you've affected someone's life. And I think volunteering your time... Um, you know, is, is an important thing to do for everybody. You know, it's something that I encourage my kids to do and, and everybody really, because I think not only can you help someone else, but in doing so, you help yourself. You know, you are able to give your gifts and talents to somebody else. And it doesn't have to be, you know, at the Sinclair Health Mission, you could be doing anything. You know, even just when you're, you know, downtown helping someone, you know, that might need your help opening a door. You know, anything, any little thing like that, I think, ju it just makes the world a better place. Okay. Um, how do your, what do your kids do when they help out? Like, what, how do they help the St. Clair Health Mission? Oh, we have lots of stuff to do. We have um, a lot of data that needs to go into the computer. So anytime they can sit in front of a computer, they're pretty happy. Um, but they do things like, you know, pull charts for us that we need to, or file charts back, or, you know, they'll come and clean once in a while. They don't like to do that, but they will come and clean or organize, um, decorate for Christmas, those kinds of things they'll come and do. They're there a lot. Um, sometimes they're just there hanging out, and other times, you know, but if we need them to pitch in, they'll definitely pitch in and, you know, maybe run things over to the hospital or do errands, those kinds of things. Um, so were there any patients that you really felt had an impact on your life at all? Oh, boy. You know what? Um, lots and lots and lots of patients. In fact, any time you come into contact with someone who has led a different life than you have led, and you really can connect with them and talk to them and try to understand them, and what they, their journey that they've gone through I think really impacts you, you know, I think of, um, yeah, there's just, there's so many people that I've met that I've learned things from, and people that you wouldn't normally um, think that of. You know, I, I met a man in, who had been in jail from the time he was 18 till he was 38. He had just gotten out of jail. Um, and it was the most interesting conversation because there were so many things that, he didn't know because he had never been taught them in his life. You know, he grew up without, you know, mother, father, role model, and grew up on the streets and was in trouble and ended up in prison. And, you know, it, it makes me, it just helps me to understand why people are where they are. Um, and he, he taught me a lot about, you know, how do you know what is right or wrong if nobody's ever taught that to you? You know, so now he, you know, has had a mentor in prison and a mentor now that he's out, and he's learning all sorts of things um, that he had never been taught as a kid. 
so he, you know, it, and it's that, you know, just for him to share that in his life with me was just, you know, a, just really had an impact and helped me understand kind of why people are. But there, there's, every day at the clinic, a patient impacts you. I think the people that are poor um, are really tough people. Um, you know, they, you know, just to be able to, or to have to live out on the streets and not know where you're eating next and, you know, weather the elements in the winter and, you know, not know if you're going to have money to do anything. Um, and, you know, they just, they have so many struggles and they keep getting back up, you know, and I think, oh, I don't know that I could do it. <laughs> you know, they come and they wait in line at the clinic, you know, starting at 3.30 sometimes. And I think, oh, no way could I be outside for, you know, an hour and a half in the cold. And I hate walking back and forth to my car when it's cold out. And so I, I look at that and I think, wow, there's this group of people is so resilient and what keeps them going. So you kind of get down to the core of people and what drives people and, and what, you know, what happiness is um, without all the stuff. So it's, um, yeah, every day there's a patient that impacts me and some of it's sad. You know, some of it is, you know, we'll see someone, um, just within the last month we had a woman walk in and she hadn't been feeling well for a while, but didn't have any money to go to the doctor. And she had an x-ray at the clinic, and she has lung cancer. And, you know, they can't treat her. She's too far advanced. And so, you know, I, I, those kinds of things affect you because you think, oh, you know, it's not fair that someone couldn't go to the doctor to find this out. And had she been able to, had she been able to afford it, and she would have gone in earlier. Could it have been caught earlier? And would she, you know, be okay now maybe? But instead, she's in hospice and, you know, probably won't live much longer. So those kinds of things, um, when you see them in real life, really affect, you know, really, they really have an effect on you. Um, so for, was there any, like, specific, patient at all that you just know that you'll never forget and they just had were really important to you or something or oh boy you know what there's there's probably I bet I can think of about five that really um that really have had effect and they're all very very different you know one was probably the man that came out of prison because that was I had he just helped me gain such an understanding. And then another man was a drug addict who was now recovered. But, you know, my conversation with him just really helped me understand um, what he went through in life and what other people who have problems with addiction feel and go through. Um, we had a woman just last year that came in and had advanced breast cancer. And even though she was dying, she would reach out to all of us, all the volunteers at the clinic, you know, and send us little things and thank us. And we just, you know, it just, things like that touch you. And, and there's other people, there's people that you um, see that, you know what, our volunteers did a really good job. We'll get letters, even years later sometimes, from patients who write and say, you know, you saved my life. And we maybe didn't even know it at the time. Um, and it, maybe it wasn't because they were physically dying, but maybe emotionally, you know, they felt like they were dying. And just to have one person who maybe connected with them and let them know that they were important and had a reason to be here. So, you know, there are definitely patients um, that kind of stay with you forever. And the, uh, you know, some of our patients will go on and get insurance, and they'll come back and, you know, they just touch base. It, it gets to be, you know, kind of a family setting, and you know, I think it is because, you know, the, our, the volunteers are just purely non-judgmental. You know, everybody is welcome, everybody is treated with dignity, um, and everybody has something to offer and something to teach everybody. Um. 
you guys have really good questions. Uh, Gosh. What was the most exciting part working at the St. Clair's Health Mission? The most exciting part? Um, oh boy, there's a lot of exciting parts. Um, I think a, a couple Christmases ago, I remember a, a couple came in and the wife was pregnant due within the next couple of weeks and her husband, they, these were both people that had graduated from college. Um, the wife had quit her job because she was going to be a stay-at-home mom and take care of her baby. And in the meantime, the husband had um, been diagnosed with mental illness. And it was kind of came on really sudden. And he ended up in the hospital. And he ended up losing his job. And they ended up losing their apartment. And this couple was staying down at the Salvation Army. And Christmas was like three weeks away. And he just kept bouncing in and out of the hospital to the Salvation Army. And then <clears throat> and this, they didn't have family in the area. So the wife was staying at the Salvation Army. And <clears throat> they came into the clinic one night because they needed help getting some medications. And I remember talking to our social worker saying, you know, there's no way this woman can be at the Salvation Army and have her baby down there. You know, someone's going to, either I'm going to take her home or someone else is going to take this poor person home. Because it just seems so sad to have a baby when you're staying at the Salvation Army. And, you know, and so there were a bunch of volunteers there that night. And all the volunteers went back to their places of work. And our social worker went to Kool-Aid Cap. And within probably 10 days, so many people had worked so hard that um, they were able to get an apartment for this family. And before they moved in, these different groups from these different volunteers went in and had their apartment decorated with a Christmas tree and Christmas presents. And people had donated cribs and baby clothes and all this stuff. So when they walked into their apartment, it was all decorated for Christmas with, you know, all the baby stuff all decked out. And it was just, you know, everybody that had been affected by that went out and told, you know, the people that surrounded them. So it ended up being this kind of a pay it forward, you know, where, you know, it just kept spreading and spreading. And all the stuff was coming to the clinic for them. And it was just, it was, it was really a fun you know, it was a fun Christmas just to see, be able to see something like that happen for, for another couple. So, what was the most frustrating part working at the St. Clair's Health Mission? Oh, you know, the most frustrating part is that we see people that are sick, um, and their illnesses have progressed to advanced stages. That and they didn't have to be so advanced. You know, like the woman with lung cancer. She could have been diagnosed earlier. You know, we see people with diabetes and now they have kidney problems and eye problems that won't go away. And those people could have been diagnosed earlier had they been able to go to the doctor. And so that's what's, that, that is frustrating that there's a group of people and because they don't have enough money, they you know, can't get the help that they need to save their life. So those days, those those times are really frustrating because you just think, oh, you know, if we were, if this country was, you know, committed to taking care of people, we wouldn't have to see these people that, you know, now will suffer for the rest of their lives because they weren't diagnosed earlier. So what? What are your goals for St. Clair's Oh, well, other than to ultimately close it down, <laughs> we always, you know, we're always doing new things. We're always trying um, new programs, um, you know, and most of what we do, we ask the patients, you know, what would you guys like us to do? Because I have sometimes in my head what I think we should be doing, but it might not fit the needs of the people that we're serving. So, um, you know, we have a group of patients that work with us to come up with um, new things that the clinic should do. Um, our big one is we're really, really, really trying hard to get everybody to quit smoking. So that's our goal for this year. That's our main goal is um, 
We're really trying to work with our patients and anybody that wants to quit smoking, we're having them come into smoking classes and um, trying to get them hooked up with some medications that can help people stop quit smoking. So that's our short-term goal this year. Um, but like I said, we're, we're always trying to just make things a little, a little bit better for people. So what was what is your most important message you want to get across and why? The most important message that I want to get across? Oh boy, that's a hard question. Um, you know, I think the message would be to, just for everybody to kind of, you know, look inside yourself and see what you have that you can give to make the world a little better place. Um, I know when I was in middle school, that was probably never on, never anywhere in my mind at the moment. Um, but you do find out that when you're doing stuff for other people, you know, whether it be in a group or alone, it just, it just makes you feel good. I mean, even if you hold the door open for somebody, you get that little, you know, just kind of feel good feeling. And if we all acted on that, um, the world would be a much, much better place. And I think, like I said, we all have it in us, and we all have gifts that we can give others to, you know, help them out when they need it. And then you get a lot in return as well. Um, so um, we read that you went to Chicago with your mom for the, with, with your mother with oh, the, yeah. um, the, the lung. Yep, the lung yeah. cancer partnership. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yep. So, what were your experiences there? Um, it was interesting. My my mom was diagnosed with lung cancer. It was three years ago, Christmas, and um, you know, when you first get a diagnosis l like that with with you know anyone that you love, you're kind of in shock for a while, and then um, you know, then you're kind of spurred into action. What can you do? And what I found out is that um, people that have lung cancer are treated very differently than somebody that may have another type of cancer, like for instance, breast cancer. Um, and part of the reason is there's a stigma related to smoking. You know, if somebody smoked, they kind of brought it on themselves, is, is the thought that some people had. But um, even more than that, there's not money going into research lung cancer, even though lung cancer kills more people than you know, the top cancers, I think it's breast, colon, prostate, at least those three cancers combined. So it just seemed so strange to me that, you know, never did I think it would ever affect, you know, anybody in my life, but now that it had, it just seemed strange that, boy, we put a, a lot of money researching breast cancer and colon cancer and we don't put any money into researching lung cancer, which is killing more people than all the other cancers. So um, my mom and I signed up for the first, it was the very first national conference for the Lung Cancer Partnership um, in Chicago. And we went down there and what they were talking about is how do we you know, motivate people to make change so that um, lung cancer can be become more of a focus and that people realize how many, you know, how it's impacting so many lives and that so many people are dying and um, there's no screening for lung cancer so when it's caught, it's usually caught very late. There's no really very good treatments because there hasn't been any money put into lung cancer for research. So that's what we went to in, in um, Chicago, it, it was a really interesting experience kind of being at one of those first meetings because you have a lot of different views in the room. Um, and, you know, they, some of them tend to butt heads a little bit about how you move forward with something like this. Um, but it was really interesting, and I really think you need opposite points of view at the table to come to your very best plan. You know, because no one person has the very best plan. It comes from a combination of um, like-minded as well as not like-minded people. 
you know, so it was it was an interesting, interesting weekend down in Chicago. But it was good. It was it was good, and I think things are. I'm starting to hear more and more of um, lung cancer awareness. So that'll be ultimately that'll be good. Um, going back a little bit, but um, when did you first decide to do nursing? Um, I decided to do nursing when I was in college, and I had actually gone to college planning on going to medical school because I thought I'd. I, you know, because I had always, I, I always knew I wanted to be in the healthcare field, um, but I really thought I wanted to be a doctor. And then I got to college and started out on the pre-med track and realized, <laughs> actually after meeting my husband who had gone through medical school and was a resident that, you know, I, I didn't know that that's what I, I wanted. Um, that I wanted to be put that much time into the training, um, that we could both do it, you know, that he could be a physician and I could be a physician and we'd be able to see each other enough and um, have kids and be able to raise a family. Um, but not only that, what I found out was nursing is very different than being a physician um, because you're with the patient more than you are if you're a physician and you get to um, you know you really get to know the family and you really get to know the patient and so that's what I really loved about it um, so that's really what made me kind of change paths and go into nursing and nursing is it's one of those fields that you can do just tons and tons and tons of stuff and you can be very flexible so it works really well um, to have a family and have kids and um, work around your other obligations Um, you guys are really. Did you come up with all these questions on your own? Yeah, we we. Gosh, we spent a long, a lot of time. I we, bet you did. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um. So, what advice would you give to kids who want to help the community at all? Or. Um, I would say do something you love and find a way to um, reach out to the community by doing something you love. Um. You know, it's not, you know, because that's what's going to keep you coming back, and that's what's going to really, um, really kind of spur your desire. You know, I always tell people that want to come and volunteer at the Sinclair Health Mission, you know, it has to fit for them. It has to be a good fit, because some people um, would be much happier building or doing, like, Habitat for Humanity, where they can actually build something and see it finished. You know, and other people, um, you know, might want to work at a food pantry or might want to even just do stuff in their neighborhood. So whatever you love to do, I always think that's a really good place to start your volunteering is just find something you love to do. If you love to be with people or you love to be with animals or you love to be outside in nature, start there um, and look for something in that area where you can volunteer your time. Do you think that all like, people should try to do something for, like, even anywhere, like, any community? Like, do you think that even adults and kids should all try to do something? I definitely do. Different? Yeah, I think that's what, you know, that's what makes a community really great is that everybody pitches in. Because we're all responsible for the community. You know, I even look at the schools, and if our schools are struggling, it's the whole community's responsibility to help out in our schools. Um, if, you know, and if there's other areas in our community that we're struggling, because we're a better community if we all pitch in and help everybody out. So, you know, and, and you know, so I do think it's, it's everybody's responsibility in their community to just do something to give back and make our community a better place. You know, and in turn, you know, we know when we're doing stuff like that, we feel better. And so, and it just kind of keeps that ball rolling. Mm -hmm. Wow, you guys. <laughs> Those are really, really good. Um, I think 
I think we basically got everything. Wow, good. Well, you guys did a great job. Those are really good questions, really hard questions. Thanks for coming. Oh, gosh, I'm glad to come. I'm, um, I think it's a neat project you're doing, it a is. really neat project. You guys are lucky to be able to do that. Um, you know, I think especially as girls, it's just important to be able to kind of reach out to those who have come before us. I mean, I know that I, you know, I look at other women that have kind of come before me and think, wow, they're amazing, you know, and know that you guys can do anything you want, and you, know, you see that more and more, that women are taking leadership roles. So it's good for you guys that you guys do this. What a great project. Who else? What other people are coming in? Um, um we have... So I know Tara, and she's fabulous. Mm -hmm. We have Rita Jenks, and... That thing sounds familiar. Um, let's see. On Friday, we're having Kara, or Vicki Gunderson. Okay. She, her son committed to his own jail, and she's trying to... Oh, I know who that is. Oh, she's really good, you guys. Good and job. Let's see. The, I don't know who, but the person that donated the building for the children's museum. Oh. And the people that, I think the It's the Reinhardt, I think. Who is it? And Stoyer. Okay. Who runs the... Oh, you guys, great. Yeah, yeah you do. We have a big list. Of a big, big long list. list. But yeah, we have all of them listed out. And well, good. Well, you guys are... You'll learn a lot. I'd like to sit and talk with a lot of these people. Because <laughs> there really are amazing people. Um, but you can just learn so much from their life experience. It's just really nice to know that lots of, like, what you're doing and everyone else is doing to just help the community and everything. It's just really well, nice. Well, yeah. Well, it all starts, though, with you guys. It really does. You know, I, I always tell my kids, there's so much on your generation because... You know, you guys have seen so much. And I, I look at, I think you guys are so much better at looking outside your school walls at what's going on. Where, when I went to school, it was kind of, it was all about the social stuff within the school. You know, <laughs> we didn't know what was going on in the community or we just, you know, that wasn't the focus back then. And so I just think it's so great that you kids are looking outside the school walls at kind of the bigger the bigger picture so I think you know that's kind of what got our country in a little bit of trouble is when we all just kind of keep to ourselves and we don't look outside and see what's really going on so that's good that you guys you guys will change the world I have no doubt <laughs> <laughs> no pressure but I think you guys are this is your generation is gonna be just so much fun to watch you are. You're smart and beautiful and thoughtful. <laughs> so it is. It's a fun, just a fun generation. Well, thank you guys. I'm excited. Great yeah. to meet you. You guys are just awesome. Awesome, awesome. Um, you can have some, there's some candy out if you want any. Or oh, thank you. <laughs> you guys, you did such a great job. You really did. You did, had really good questions, and it was so nice to be met at the door. This podcast brought to you from Lacrosse, Wisconsin by Akula at Longfellow Middle School in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.